and uniquely controversial conflict. And so, because it's uniquely complex and uniquely controversial, it's not easily amenable to a resolution. And the other kind of explanation goes something like this. There are moderates in the region, and there are extremists or radicals in the region. And the problem is that the moderates haven't been able to prevail over the extremists and the radicals. And what I want to do this evening is along with you, I want to test those two propositions. Number one, I want to test the proposition with you. Is this a particularly controversial conflict? Or is it, as I will try to suggest, probably the least complicated, the least controversial conflict in the world today. And number two, accepting for argument's sake that the problem is that the moderates are being outflanked by the extremists and the radicals, we want to ask the simple question, assuming that's true, <coughs> Who are the radicals in the region? Who are the extremists in the region? Are the radicals to be found in Tehran and Damascus? Or are the radicals and extremists to be found in Tel Aviv and Washington? Now, as we move along, I'm going to try to stick to very strict criteria to test our propositions. Number one, I will do my best, and you will be the judge. I'll do my best to stick to the most mainstream, uncontroversial, reputable sources. And number two, well, let's just leave it at that for now. I'll stick to most mainstream, reputable sources as I make my case. So let's start with an example, an illustration of the point I want to make. In 2004, in July 2004, the highest judicial body in the world, the International Court of Justice, had to rule on a particular question bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict. The General Assembly, the United Nations General Assembly, put a question to the International Court. And the question was this. They asked the court, can you tell us what are the legal consequences what are the legal repercussions of the wall that Israel has been building in the West Bank? Well, a lot of pressure was put on the international court not to address the question. But after some deliberation, the court decided, OK, we'll entertain this question. And the court reached the conclusion that the wall that Israel is building is illegal. But that's not important for our purposes. <coughs> for our purpose, purposes, the more important question is, for our purposes, the more important question is, what did the court have to decide before it decided that the wall is illegal? And the court had to do the following. Number one, the court had to decide what are the borders. The court had to decide 
what are the borders of the state of Israel? Because if Israel is building a wall on its border or inside the state of Israel, of course, every sovereign state has the right to build a wall on its border or within its state. But if Israel is building a wall outside its border and in somebody else's state, legal problems obviously arise. No different than if somebody in this room, their family, wanted to build a fence and decided the fence is going to go around their neighbor's garage or swimming pool. Legal problems arise. But if you want to build a fence on your border or within, no problem arises. So the first question the court had to decide was, what are the borders of the state of Israel? Number two, it happens that the wall takes what's called a sinuous route. That's the expression the International Court used. Sinuous means winding. The wall takes this sinuous route, which incorporates about 80% of the Israeli settlements on the Israeli side of the wall. So the court now had to ask itself a second question. What is the legal status of those settlements that Israel has been building in the occupied territories? Because Israel said, we're building the wall in order to protect the settlements. But there's a basic legal principle the basic legal principle goes like this. You cannot derive a right from a wrong. Now, I know that sounds a little bit complicated. You don't quite grasp what it means. But it's not really complicated at all. It means if something is wrong in the first place, you can't get a right to defend what's wrong in the first place. So if the settlements are illegal in the first place, you can't claim a right to defend what's wrong to begin with. If the settlements are wrong to begin with, you can't have a right to protect them the only right you have is to remove them. You can't get a right from a wrong. So the second question the International Court of Justice had to ask is, what, are, what is the legal status of these settlements? And then the third question they had to ask themselves is, what's the legal status of East Jerusalem? Because as it happens, the wall that Israel is building cuts right through East Jerusalem, trying to put most of the Arabs on the Palestinian side and keep most of the Jews on the Israeli side. So they have to ask themselves, what's the legal status of East Jerusalem? Because if East Jerusalem is Israeli territory, well, obviously they have a right to build a wall within or on the border of East Jerusalem. But if East Jerusalem is not Israeli territory, well, the same problem arises as if your parents decide to build a fence around your neighbor's swimming pool, or right through your neighbor's swimming pool. Now, Here's the coincidence. Most of you in this room have heard of what's called the peace process. How many people have heard that expression, the peace process? Raise your hands, I know. Good. It's the longest running soap 